Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This podcast series is proudly brought to you by Russell Investments. With more than 80 years of experience, Russell Investments is a global investment solution partner dedicated to helping investors reach their long-term goals. Russell Investments specialize in multi-asset solutions that combine asset allocation, capital markets insights, actor exposure, manager research, and portfolio implementation. Welcome back to the XY Advisor Podcast. I'm Fraser Jack, and today we are into part four of our five-part series on ESG investing. Uh, today we're really looking at um, going a little bit deeper into what is the E, the environmental part, the uh, the social part, and uh, and the governance, and then also having a think about an overlay of what that looks like when you're having these conversations, uh, prioritizing conversations with your clients um, as well as the funds. Welcome back, Philip Moffat. Hi, Fraser. Thank you for joining us. Now uh, you're you're the, you're the perfect person to ask this question. So let's dive. Let's take a deeper dive into the you know the environmental. Uh, let's start with the E and then move on to the S and the G. Uh, tell us what they are. Tell us how they work. Um, let's go a little bit deeper into what, what's involved in each part. Yeah. Well, look, I think at the top level they are what they say on the can. You know, so we're thinking about how assets or businesses affect their environment. Um, Loosely, I guess people think about the physical environment. So it's climate and land uh, degradation and and so on. And there are a bunch of kind of metrics and ideas that are popularly understood, like carbon footprint, right, or soil quality or water use. You know, and those things can be measured uh, and reported on and compared. Social is a little more amorphous, I think, than environmental. Um, because social kind of means everything else in a sense. And so that's how you interact with your community. It's the jobs you provide. It's who you employ. It's how you employ them. It's how you treat them, um, how you treat communities around your assets or businesses. And so it's somewhat harder to find metrics that are universally accepted and understood in that space. So it's a bit looser. And governance uh, is really... Uh, trying to have confidence that the reporting and understanding you're getting around social and environmental as well as financial uh, returns from these assets is verifiable and comes at standards that you um, you can accept and, and and are acceptable to the marketplace. So the governance part's the, in a sense the cleanest. So the government the governance part is I guess the part that's always sort of been around a lot of businesses um, because it's already been there. The environmental part, as you mentioned, there is a lot of um, there is a lot of measurements. It's, it's a lot easier to measure. I want you to overlay the impact because uh, you obviously do a lot of work in the space of in, impact investing. Is that mainly in that social area? Do you find or uh, no? It's both. It's both. Um, what what we're really looking for is is people get can you know a bit confused and and I don't think the market's been very clear about what the difference between ESG sustainability and impact are. And if you ask three people, you might get four views. But um, to our mind, uh, impacts are about outputs. So. The outcomes from a business will have an impact on employment or the environment. or And, and what an impact investor is doing is generally taking the UN um, SDGs, so a set of measures the UN has prioritised uh, for uh, businesses and assets to try and focus on to improve their footprint, social footprint, and trying to line up the outputs of the business with some of those ESGs so that we go uh, ESGs. Um, SDGs, so that we can say, here's a business that's set out to reduce its carbon footprint, and this is the overall reduction in its footprint. ESG refers to more how they do it and what the processes are in place to get them there and how they're improving or not improving. So they go together, uh, but but they're different. And, and I guess our um, investment thesis is that because they go together, at the moment we focus on ESG more in the marketplace. It's a more readily understood concept. It goes better with sustainability. That's really the heart, the beating heart of improving businesses' uh, social impact and valuation. 
and the impact they generate over time is a, going to be a, a convenient way, a convenient universal way of reporting what some of those uh, improvements look like. Yeah. Okay. So, so focusing a lot on those out the outcomes of those improvements, and and then being yes. able to quantify they yes. and, and 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 provide some messaging around these are these are what we're trying to do in the world. Yes, exactly. And so eventually, you have businesses or assets that um, can say to the marketplace, "These are our practices." This is what we're trying to produce, a financial return, but we also are trying to produce a series of measurable outcomes that have an impact in our community. And it could be an employment, number one's employment. You know, the very best thing anyone or any organization can do is provide jobs. Jobs and income is top of the list from our perspective. It could be provide jobs. It could be provide jobs in certain sectors to certain sorts of people. It could be environmental. It could be educational. It could be uh, health issues. Here are the things that we're going to measure and report on because they really matter to us. But the guts of the ESG is the, is the operational machine rather than the output yep. at the end. Yep. Can you give us some other examples of impact um, businesses that are doing great in this space? You know, strictly defined impact, uh, people would talk about businesses that are set up with an objective of meeting some of those UN SDGs. So I don't even start my business without knowing what the end uh, outcome is. We talk about theory of change and so on. And I'm sure you'll have some people on the podcast who, who talk about that stuff. I guess from our perspective as investors, from Beckon's perspective or my personal perspective, is that I'm not necessarily attracted to businesses that already know what those outcomes are. They are attractive. What I'm really attracted to is businesses or assets that have output at the end but don't really understand it and they need to be taken on a journey or they want to be taken on a journey to understand what those potential impacts are and how they can be measured. So I think about a really simple business we invested in, a business called Slurry Tub, where um, at the end of the day when the builder washes out his uh, concrete mixer, uh, you know, he hoses it out, that um, slurry is highly alkaline. It's supposed to go in an absorption pit and all sorts of stuff. And I'm sorry to say, lots of builders just tip it down the sewer or they dump it on the grass and it finds its way into the water table and it's it's full of heavy metals. It's dreadful, right? So an entrepreneurial builder bought this idea of slurry tub, which is basically think about a big coffee filter, plastic tray with a paper liner. You put the slurry into that. It captures all the heavy metals and all the, the alkaline debris and stuff and out the bottom runs water. Beautiful. He bought us that idea knowing that it had an environmental impact but also knowing that it was potentially going to drive a profitable business. He hadn't thought about measuring the heavy metals, hadn't thought about measuring the quantity of water. When we help him to measure those things, then he's got impact that he can report into the marketplace. But this is an impact naive business really that is a pure impact business. And so that's a great example of um, businesses that are set up to generate return and have a social impact that aren't wouldn't originally qualify as impact but really are and how they can be taken on a journey to that, that reporting standard. Yeah, fantastic, fantastic example. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, just lastly on this topic, as we go through advisors um, talking to their clients and I, I just want to lean into the prioritisation conversation because, you know, it's, it, the, in a perfect world we have, you know, an equal quantity of ES and G and that all works together and the business does all those things. But look, what, tell us in reality how this works with um, clients prioritising one over the other. Yeah, well, there you go. So... If you can improve your E at the cost of your S, do you do it? If you improve your S at the cost of your E, do you do it? Do you only improve both? Really difficult uh, conversation because it's it, it goes from taking a set of, of ideas that we all think are important, you know, improving the environment or providing jobs or, or, or what have you, to I'm going to value this one above that one. And so the relative valuation of these different elements is something that nobody's going to agree on. I, I would guess that the optimal path for advisors and investors is to try and see a path forward on all and to reject anything where you think a path forward on one leads to a degradation of the other. But you've also got to think that in the world of imperfect information and standards of reporting, if I'm a business that's going to improve my environmental uh, impact at the cost of social, I might focus on the environmental impact and underplay the social, and that's why you need really rigorous due diligence around this stuff and why the industry is really in its infancy uh, around these valuation questions. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you for uh, adding that uh, the, those gems. Philip, we'll catch you in the next episode where we talk about supply and demand. Okay, cool. Thanks, Fraser. 
Welcome back to this episode, Elizabeth. Thanks, Fraser, um, and thank you for the um, invite. <laughs> no problem. Now, this episode, we're talking about the idea of, you know, prioritization. We're looking at the E, the S, and the G separately, and working out how. What sort of conversations are you having with your clients at the moment around, um, you know, what they what they what they are? Do you go into each one? Um, and, and if so, let's let's sort of go. Let's dive into that idea. Um, what 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 would you say to your clients that um, want to break down what is in the E, S, and G? I um, usually say to them is. E, S, and G, or ethical and sustainable and responsible investing, something that is an issue for them, and which bits of it are. Um, so you actually need to ask clients the question. Um, and the other thing I usually say is, and the response is usually, well, you, you tell me. And uh, then my response is, well, this is a very individual thing. What's important to you in terms of ESG and being responsible is different to what's important for me. Um, I use a fairly basic um, questionnaire that they can or can't fill in. Um, and the reason for doing that is so that they can actually start to think about which one of these things is or isn't important. What sort of things are what sort of things on your questionnaire? Um, do you know um, if your super fund invests in um, and which of these issues are important to you, uh, what is or isn't and what might or mightn't be important? Um, my experience with this is that people fail to fill it out and that the questions, which I think are fairly straightforward, are just too difficult for people to grapple with. Um and because they haven't thought about these things before and they don't want to. Um, and usually when people talk about ESG and that they're wanting to invest in this type of fund or to divest of something else, it usually comes down to one or two issues. Like what I'm interested in is forest degradation, so I don't want my funds going to anyone that does this sort of work. Or... I'm really interested in human rights and I don't want my funds to go to anything that, um, um, that uh, is taking advantage of, of, of conditions in other parts of the world such as slavery. I have one client who um, is invested in something that's very, very um, – that has done very well but it has Rio in it and he doesn't like Rio. Another client who – I uh, didn't want to invest in the, the similar sort of fund because they had Woolworths because, and because Woolworths was then associated with pokies, which is not anymore. Those things are what really, st- what really stuck with people. So it's incredibly individual. And some people are into animal rights. It's a matter of drilling down and saying, this is a fund or a series of funds or options that I think may be suitable, depending on what you've said. And so why don't you have a ch- why don't you choose? I think that they're all similar in terms of what it is that you're wanting. Is there anything in particular? And just on that, because I think the questionnaire is great to have some sort of a questionnaire that goes through a lot of those underlying aspects, you know, like in not just environmental and or, or governance as, as the main headings, but going into like what is it, as you said, um, deforestation or yep. climate change or greenhouse gas emissions mm. um, and and – and in that questionnaire, because I'm just trying this on as a consumer, is this something that might be I more along the lines of I don't want, I don't want this and I don't want that yep. and therefore yep. that, that pushes me? Or yep. is this more something that I guess depends on the person, but is it I do want this, like a, a towards motivation? So um, the questionnaire is, basic, is basically got, you know, these are kind of like 10 major issues that have been identified as uh, issues of concern. What do you think about them? I care, I don't care, or it doesn't make any difference. It yep. goes along those sorts of lines. Yep. So saying it's quite difficult to find a product that fits everything that is that the client's wanting yep. and that there has to be some choice and uh, that people let go of, okay, well, if it's mostly what I want, then it will be okay. Yep. Okay. So it's um, if it doesn't have the things that they hate, that's the first step, yes. and then if they and then if they move if if you're moving towards something yeah. that they do want, then that's sort of yeah. the second step. Is that, what, yeah. Is that yeah, yeah, and and taking into account that some of the biggest um, 
polluters, for example, in Australia, are moving down the track to become more green and they're also funding initiatives to become better in terms of you know environmental degradation. If they're moving along the right way and if they're actually demonstrating that this is what they're doing, is that good enough for you? Yeah. Okay. So it's just having those conversations with the client to work out. And it can't be black and white. Yep. It's yeah, not black and white. Yeah. yeah. Um, you sort of worked sorry. that out all before, wasn't yep. yep. There's, there's, uh, there's, there is no, it's all, it's all 50 shades, isn't it? There's, uh, there's, there is no, uh, there's no perfect solution here. It's around yep. finding a balance. Yep. That's right. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Elizabeth, for coming on this episode. Uh, we look forward to chatting to you in the final episode of the series. Okay, thank you. Thanks for joining us again, Paul Garner. Thank you very much. Now, in this episode, we are going deeper into the ES and or, or G, I should say, and talking about how we talk to our clients about individual uh, considerations and prioritisation. Um, let's start with the environmental. Yeah, well, the process... I go through is uh, uh, I've got there's a series of uh, it, it's it's like a fact find type of thing uh, of of pro forma based on environmental societal and governance issues. For instance, fossil fuels uh, would be a specific uh, environmental issue. Uh, do they want to support that? Avoid it? Neutral about it? Or want to know more about it? So uh, we go through each environmental issue and the individual indicates what their feelings are about that particular issue. From that uh, vetting process, we gain a picture of what's important to them, what do they want to support in terms of invest more in, what do they want to avoid in and, and, and have nothing to do with. So from that picture, we then try to match that with what's available uh, in the market, uh, in general managed fund types of things, and if they don't, if if there's no like off the shelf option for them, then it's up to us to design a very specific and customised portfolio to address what what's important to them. That's not an original idea. <laughs> that fact find it's 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 it, the uh, Responsible Investment Association and and my colleagues have have all um, been very influential in in developing that sort of vetting system. Yeah, that makes sense. Now, with your own little um, mini fact find um, regarding the ESG part, what sort of things are you bringing up in the environmental space? What, what is, I mean, obviously fossil fuels is one, but what else? Yeah, that, look, that's that's a key one. The other is uh, mining. Some people are dead against any mining. Uh, others will tolerate uh, gold, uh, lithium, uh, anything to do with the making of batteries, uh, for instance, which is vital in that in that area, logging, old growth forests, uh, tobacco. Oh, no, there's more of the uh, uh, societal area. That, look, fossil fuels is the huge one. Renewables is the other support area that people are really concerned about on the environmental side. Yep. So if we go environmental, if we just chunk into that, you know, avoiding, say, fossil fuels, um, do you then also put your renewable energy as... Um, you know, to support. So do you have sort of both in your fact fund? Yeah, indeed, indeed. Yep. Okay, so you, it's not just the, say, the fossil fuels of the world. Yeah. It's also the renewables and the positive ones so they can actually say, no, I want to support that and I want to avoid that. And I can, indeed. Yeah, okay, great. Indeed. And uh, if we go into the societal um, or social impact um, s- section, talk to us about what you have in there. What, what are the different sections? Uh, well, gambling is a key one. Uh, but but also more niche issues like um, stem cell research, IVF, uh, those sort of more uh, medical uh, human types of areas. Uh, genetic modification uh, is a is a very hot topic. Gambling is always a, a big issue for most people. Alcohol, yeah, uh, mm, uh, generally people are ambivalent about that because they. Uh, enjoy uh, that part of life yeah it, it, that's more subjective uh, the governance yep. side is sorry to Paul before we go to sorry. governance is there anything around um, the, the human trafficking human slavery um, or, or, yeah, or yes. equality or rights yeah it, yeah huge issue on that in terms of uh, slave labor human trafficking 
um, supply chain, that that like how deep do you go to investigate yeah. those sorts of issues? Most people are, are wanting to avoid that or support um, vetting of that area. Yeah. Uh, that, that that's probably the biggest societal issue. Union, you know, it's 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 easier for us in an Australian context to take those things for granted. Um, but when we're dealing in an international sense, it's it's very important, and and also uh, yeah. understanding where supply chains are going in those areas as well. Yeah, supply chain's been a big one, hasn't it? It's been in the news a lot lately mm. for, um, you know, it's not just the company you deal with, it's the companies they deal with Indeed. and how do, they, how do they report on that and, and how do they display that? So it's, it's, been a, it's been a tricky task, I guess. Yes, it is. And uh, and, and trickier also on uh, in terms of assets allocation, it's much easier to vet those sorts of things with uh, equity uh, funds. But when you get into the fixed interest area, that that's that can be very tough, uh, uh, but yep. we're seeing more green um, fixed interest options being available. Um, but yep. but that's a that's a real tricky area in terms of where where's that bank we're investing in uh, lending their money. Yeah, extremely difficult because it's probably not um, not uh, not common knowledge. No. Um, fantastic. So that's the social side. What about governance? Governance is how how does a company interacts with its community how does it pay its executives how does it pay its staff uh unionism uh what what are their voting uh what, what's their corporate behavior been like in terms of uh, uh banks are a great example in terms of what industries are they funding uh, there's been a lot of talk about that and a lot of activism about that too uh, yeah. Most people are very supportive of all those corporate governments issues. They want to they want to support companies who are being good corporate citizens, and that's reflected in in how they treat their own staff, uh, how they treat their suppliers, how they treat uh, the different people in their supply chains, in their in their influence areas. Yeah. Now, this is an area that I'm sort of learning a little bit about, to be fair, because obviously I sort of came at this with the idea that governance was fairly here in Australia anyway. We've we've sort of got some good processes and reporting in place. We've got re- a lot of regulators keeping an eye, a close eye on a lot of these big businesses. You know, we've seen the banks and, and others getting dragged in front of royal commissions and bits and pieces and healthcare and those sorts of things to help, hold them accountable. Um, so I sort of thought we, we had a fairly high st- set of standards of governance in this, obviously in this country and, and a few others. Um, but I'm sort of learning a little bit along the way with, with regard to, uh, you know, being able to pick and choose within those companies that if they do find themselves uh, or, you know, their behaviours are poor enough to find themselves in front of a Royal Commission, then, then uh, you know, avoiding those behaviours, avoiding those businesses. Yeah, look, again, it's such a subjective thing and um, what, what comes out in the media can often be... Um, an over an overstatement of particular areas um uh, you know the reputational damage that can be done like you just look at what happened to amp um you know behavior in certain aspects of their company just re- reflected across the whole company so um it, it like how deep do you go um how general generalized do you take these judgments it's it's a tricky area, and and it must be um very difficult for companies to navigate through as well. But then you see the uh, the influence on the behaviour of the banks in terms of uh, are they funding coal miners, for instance, and then you look at the political pressure that comes back on uh, trying to dissolve that that influence by creating political pressure about um, not having that uh, influence over over corporate decision making so it it's a it's a fine line some uh, for, for major institute or major banks in in that area in terms of how much uh, you know they get political pressure on one side to open up funding depending on what the government wants to do and then they've got societal pressure saying no we don't want you to fund this that sort of activity and uh, they're in the middle trying to make those decisions yeah, it's interesting. I, I, I no way think it's an easy to see, you know, 
position to be in to um to have those conflicting mm. conflicting concepts to coming at you and having to make a decision to um to keep everybody happy. Paul, thanks so much for for sharing um, your thoughts and ideas around what you do in this space for helping clients understand. Um, you know, the things that are important to them. I, I really like the, the system that you have where it's, a, you know, avoid support neutral or more information. I think that's a, a great, a great um, takeaway from this episode. So, uh, Paul, thank you so much for um, being involved and we'll see you in the next episode. Thank you. Welcome back to this episode, Alexandra. Thanks so much, Fraser. Great to be here. Fantastic. Now we are talking about uh, all uh, going a bit of a deeper dive into the ESRG uh, conversation and then we'll after that we'll have a chat about prioritisation. Tell me, let's start with environmental. What what are the big things you're seeing in this space and, and uh, from both you know advisors and, and fund managers and consumers? Yeah, great question. Uh, with the environmental, what I've noticed more and more as well is that it's being separated into positive and negative environmental. You know, before it used to just be lumped into this whole like ES and G and these are the environmental issues, but it's it's really being separated into what's harmful and controversial and then also what's creating positive impact. So I, I love seeing that. And I think as far as the harmful areas go, uh, you know, there, there is the usual ones, you know, animal cruelty and fossil fuels and, and uh, environmental dis- destruction and things like that. But I'm seeing more of more areas around things like palm oil uh, and plastics and other forms of air, water and land pollution. And just referring to palm oil, I've got it in the environmental section, but it really does straddle the social uh, aspect as well. And, you know, a lot of people, when they think of palm oil, they just think of deforestation and, and clearing of land. But there are so many issues with women and children, especially in their supply chains and in, in their, as workers as well. And it's just, it's horrific. A lot of social issues. Uh, but I guess turning to now to the environmental, the positive areas, uh, what I'm seeing there is lots of things like clean transport, clean technology, energy efficiency, recycling, uh, sustainable forestry, sustainable food systems, really big one too. And uh, circular economy is coming out loud and clear now, which is uh, basically it's a um, it's based on the principles of designing out waste and pollution. So designing out waste and pollution, keeping products and materials in use in that cycle and also regenerating natural systems. Yeah, amazing. This, uh, I like the idea that it's trans, uh, that it's moving towards that negative and positive. It makes it really easy for a consumer to, to understand that and to be able to say whether they're for or against or they feel strongly or not so strongly um, about those uh, when, when, when it's presented as for and against rather than just presented as a – a thing, you know, how do you feel positive, negative? Um, I think it's easier to quantify their, um, their attitudes towards it. Uh, talk to us about this, the social uh, aspects. What, what are you seeing in that space? So with social, again, if we're looking at the harmful, there's the, the typicals, there's, you know, the alcohol, gambling, tobacco, weapons, pornography. Uh, they're usually like those big negative screens. A lot of them have been around for a long time and, and advisors, you know, possibly more aware of those things. But we're seeing a bit more of things like excessive consumerism becoming a bit more to the forefront, Uh, correctional and detention facilities as well, predatory finance, so the the buy now, pay later and the the, uh, payday lending and things like that, Uh, sugar and junk food, a big social issue now as well, harmful when when it comes to people's health. So that's more on the the, the negative side. Yeah, the... the the predatory finance is a big thing, I think, for financial advisors. I would see a lot of that, obviously, with the, the you know, buy now, pay laters and, and you know, uh, ending up with extra credit cards that you didn't even really want. Absolutely. And then having to help the clients through that. Uh, fantastic. And what, what are you seeing on that positive side of social? A lot more about equality and uh, just human development in, in general, Indigenous rights, which is, which is great to see a lot more of that more of the, the uh, social innovations, technologies, labour rights. Of course, the Sustainable Development Goals has got a huge portion of social aspects in there. Uh, inclusive finance, so making sure that finance facilities are accessible to all. You know, we take a lot for granted here that we have so many, um, we have such accessibility to finance, you know, on our mobile phones and all that sort of thing, but that's not the same across the globe. Um, and also gender diversity and gender balance as well is becoming a, 
to the forefront as well. Uh, seeing some improvements, for instance, even just in the ASX the ASX 200 boards, uh, according to the latest reports, which was July actually this year, uh, about a third of ASX 200 boards are women, which is which is great. And unfortunately, there are still two boards on the ASX that don't have any women. But yeah, gender gender balance is becoming a big thing. I think I saw something a few years ago that said there were more Peters. Uh, on in board roles than there were women. Oh Likes called Peter, and I thought that, that, that's oh my goodness. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, fantastic. Yeah, no, I I agree with uh, lo- like with um with, with a lot of that stuff. Tell me, tell us about the governance side because this is that board role kind of that board conversation also sort of fits into the governance space too, doesn't it? Yeah, absolutely, it does. So you know what's happening internally? How is the company functioning? In the harmful, then we would look at things like you know bribery, fraud, and corruption, uh, executive remuneration. So how much is the CEO getting paid compared to employees? Uh, tax avoidance. So not just being smart about tax, but actually you know finding those loopholes and, and really avoiding tax that they shouldn't be avoiding. Um, and obviously, and, and even just greenwashing from a company perspective as well is definitely in that harmful governance realm. As far as the positive governance goes, uh, seeing more of a, a look at long-termism. So uh, do, is the board, does the board take a long-term approach? Are they looking at sustainability? Are they incorporating business model resilience? Those types of things. Uh, more transparent disclosure stakeholder engagement, uh, you know, are they communicating and, and working with employees and communities and suppliers and customers? And Indigenous consent is a, is a huge one, you know, particularly around what we've seen with Rio Tinto as well and Jukun Gorge, you know, just, yeah, just having companies that, uh, boards that have a positive impact when it comes to respecting Indigenous consent are, of course, going to be seen as as being uh, better or, or yeah, better in the ESG realm. Yep. Now that we've just listed off, um, you know, a stack of different concepts when it comes to the, the three different areas and, and let's, have, let's call it the six different areas because there's a negative and positive in each one. Yeah. Then how does the advisor then have those conversations with their clients? And we sort of, you sort of touched on this in the previous episode, but there's prioritization point of view where you say, well, you can't have everything. Surely if you have everything, we're going to, we're going to, there's not going to be any funds left to recommend or, or, or any companies left to recommend. How do we have that prioritization conversation with the clients? Yeah, sure. Uh, there's, there's two, two things I probably want to discuss here, Fraser. And the first is, you know, I, I get a lot of advisors there asking me, so, well, you've, there's so many there. What do I, what do I learn first? You know, kind of thing. And so from, from a, from a learning perspective, I guess, you know, fossil fuels and climate change risk, uh, they're the, just the two big ones. Um, and biodiversity actually risk is becoming huge too. But, you know, I'm a lover of research and stats. And, uh, so of course I went to the, the, um, uh, it's a consumer survey by RIA. And in the report, it looked at, and this should be interesting for advisors too, but the top three social and environmental issues or themes that Australian investors, so potentially your clients, want to support are renewable energy and energy efficiency, sustainable water management and use, and healthcare and medical products. So those top three issues, renewables, sustainable water, and healthcare. And the top three issues that they wanted to avoid in this report is animal cruelty, tobacco, and weapons. So, you know, getting your head around these things is is clearly important to Australian investors. And the other report they had in their benchmark report, they actually used their uh, their responsible returns tool. Uh, there's um, there's an advisor interface as well that you can go and you can um, check out all the the certified products there. But people can go to their tool and put in things that they want to exclude and it shows them a list of products um, based on, on what they want to screen out. And the three most frequently used exclusionary screens, fossil fuels, human rights abuses and armaments. So we, we have a, um, you know, it's just, yeah, it will be different for there's As I said, there's that three examples. Actually, Ethos, they did another one too. They Theirs was global using that same system of, uh, taking data from, from the screens that they, that 
that they were using, which is the top causes that investors care about. Number one, climate action. Number two, sustainable resource use. And number three, gender equality. And it was really interesting to see that, you know, we got a social uh, um, aspect in there as well because they're mo- generally it's usually based on environmental. Yeah, that is that is, that is fantastic. And uh, you thought you mentioned Ethos, which is of course a a, a product um, that you, neither of us are endorsed by, by the way. That uh, that <laughs> um, that uh, talks about uh, or helps uh, helps with that conversation of prioritising. Um, uh, uh, we've also spoken uh, on some of the previous um, uh, people that have talked about this around what um, what what can be done with regards to the you know the questioning uh, for clients and there's some there's some stuff obviously from RIA and, and from the co-op that talk about uh, you know questioning techniques. What, what what sort of what do you sort of talk to your clients when you're training them and teaching them um, to use uh, as that needs analysis or that you know that idea of understanding what the client's prioritising. Yeah, great question, Fraser. And, you know, for advisors, I've mentioned questionnaire a number of times because I really would suggest that this conversation is done using a questionnaire that covers, you know, ESG concerns and what matters most to a client. And, you know, just as advisors would obtain their client's risk profile, you know, they're just going to find out their ESG or their responsible investing profile. So alongside a, a questionnaire, then you've got obviously the funds too, the, the research providers. So I would try and match a, the questionnaire with, with the product providers <laughs> to make it easier for you. Uh, so, you know, you're never going to find um, products that exactly match. You know, there's, there's going to be issues that are important to your client that aren't going to match the products. But what I'm seeing more of now is when you've got a questionnaire is using more of a ranking system when it comes to profiling your clients. So I I know that we have mentioned Ethos just one more time, but, you know, on their platform, they do have a, um, in the list of issues, the user can actually move them around. It's like a ladder and the, the client can actually move them around to work out which is the most important. And that would sit at the top. I provide advisors that I work with that I'm consulting with a questionnaire too that also uses a ranking style system in that I would have all the ESG issues listed in that positive and negative to make it easier for advisor and client. And then one to five on the other side where five is this issue is really important to me and one is I'm not so fussed about this issue and obviously in between. And as an advisor, If you go through uh, with your client using this questionnaire, pay attention to those number fives. Those issues that are really important to them are the ones that you want to focus on when you're trying to match a product with their their values and their concerns. Yeah, fantastic. And the whole idea of prioritisation is the fact that uh, not everything can be a five. No, that is correct. And you will get clients that will literally just tick the fives all the way down. Yeah, yeah. Just to finish off, I've just got a couple of tips to help advisors with client ESG discussions. And the first one is it's okay to not have the answer. So it's too hard to be an expert in all areas. It's, uh, you know, it's not your job to be an expert in all things ESG, but just enough to form the structure of your advice and just see this as a growth journey. Number two is that your clients will want to bring their expertise to the table. So if a client is particularly passionate about an issue, they are going to be a great source of information. They're going to be a great resource for you and they are going to want to bring their expertise to you. Three is that there's no investment option that's perfect. It's really just a matter about being upfront and transparent around any issues that you might find. And then my fourth tip is just to review your clients' preferences regularly because they are likely to change over time. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, uh, thanks, Alexandra, for coming on and um, and going through that with us. I, that, was really, that was really great. I really appreciate it. And I look forward to catching you in the next episode when we talk about supply and demand. Thanks so much, Fraser. James Howard, thanks for joining us again as we dig, dive a little bit deeper into the ES or G prioritization conversation. Welcome. Thanks, Fraser. Good to be back. 
Fantastic to have you. Now, uh, so, so we've been tackling this concept of, you know, let, let's go through and have a look at what uh, some of the environmental factors are, the social uh, factors that are important to both fund managers as yourself and also for clients. Um, and as we go through there, we're just sort of looking also around the prioritisation of how we have those conversations. So let's start with the, uh, the E, uh, the, the environmental side of the things. What, what's important for you in the space? Yeah, look, I'd probably focus on two things here, uh, Fraser. So um, I've, I've spoken in previous sessions about carbon emissions and um, carbon emissions data is, is actually really quite good now. So that's something that we uh, we, we measure all of our funds at Russell. Uh, we, we measure the fund's uh, carbon footprint relative to, to its benchmark, both for Australian and global shares. Um, and, and similarly, in the you know the low carbon strategies that, that I run, um, they, they've all got specific objectives or specific reductions uh, that we're looking to hit versus the benchmark so that that's kind of a i would say that's big you know fairly um common theme that, that you'll see in a lot of superannuation funds as well um the other area would would be um around green energy um so uh this is an area that that um you know i find particularly interesting clearly you know energy production is a is a big part of that carbon emissions um, and, and you know the emissions that, that we're um, releasing into the atmosphere every year. Um, what we're seeing is uh, utility companies around the world becoming more green. Uh, and, and as a result, uh, a few years ago, we developed um, a green energy ratio for a lot of these utility companies. And um, that, 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 that is a measure of um, how much of the energy um, they're producing is, is coming from renewable sources. And I think we spoke in the last session about you know positive tilts um, that's an example of a positive t- tilt we use in our um, low carbon strategy. So we we want to um, we want to have more exposure to those companies that that are producing more and more um, energy from renewables. And I, I might just uh, I think I also mentioned AGL and how that that company is, is separating you know into a, a green versus fossil fuel division. Um, a, a good example here is a, a Danish utility called Orsted. Um, that was a you know fossil fuel based um, utility provider a few years ago, and over the years that you know I've been involved in you know ESG investing, we've seen Orsted's um, green energy ratio go from quite low numbers to to well in the 90s percent wise, and um, you know it's a company that's done you know really well relative to to other utility stocks, and I think talks to the you know the you know that's where investors are positioning they're they're positioning for these companies that, that are transitioning um, for the you know a, a more sustainable and lower lower carbon future yep now when companies do that this is a really interesting part because because uh, obviously um, you know you look at an AGL and also if they if they take their fossil fuels and they divest that into a different company that the the fuels are still being emitted are they not is, is that still like I mean, obviously the money's being diverted uh, for the green funds to the to the new entity and promoting that, um, and um, we're assuming the old one's going to die off over time and, and investment mm. will, will run out. Yeah, look, there's another metric, uh, so called carbon reserves or fossil fuel reserves, and and that's the the coal, oil, and gas assets that these companies have on their balance sheets that are still in the ground and yet to be mined. Um, there is a belief that you know a lot of those will become so-called stranded assets um, because of you know Paris commitments. Um, we've got COP26, which I'm sure we'll hear more and more about um, over the course of this year in November, where you know all governments from around the world are meeting again on climate change. So I, I think the reality is that you know a lot of those fossil fuel fuel assets will become stranded and and, and won't be mined and, and burned. Um, so Yes, whilst whilst they have them on their balance sheet, you know, many companies are either trying to sell them off or or simply write them down to zero, which we've seen as well. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's it's certainly an, an aspect to be aware of. But um, uh, you know, the, the, I think what we're really looking to do is is or l- l- what we want to see is those companies positioning for the future. Yep, and this is uh, again, as you mentioned in the previous episode, this is an influential position to be in um, as you know the investment manager. Um, as well as investors, as well as consumers, to be able to, to influence um, how these companies behave in the future. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Now let's talk about social, the yes, uh, um, you know, the social impact and, and, and what what are you seeing in that space with companies? 
Yeah, I think that's it, it's in a way it's a, a harder one to to measure and manage, um, but definitely one that that is becoming you know more of a focus um, for you know for consumers, um, and I think that that's you know where engagement with with companies and 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 meeting with them and uh, and understanding their approach to social issues is more and more important. So um, probably a good example would be you know how yeah. You know, if a company is transitioning, how they're managing um, the workforce that, that might be displaced. Um, so the, the, the concept of just transition. So, you know, there's many parts of Australia that, that rely on um, these kind of industries trying to manage that, um, you know, that change of business model while still supporting local communities is, is you know, obviously, um, you know, it's a it's a fine balance to get that right. But um, yeah, in, in many instances, there are also uh, say in the Hunter Valley, um, the, the, there will be you know farm like solar farms, and, and there will be jobs that, that get created in in other areas. So I think that's that, that's kind of a one aspect of you know the, the social side of things you know, from a you know the, the environment you know the the, the energy side of things. Um, other areas would be, you know, focusing on you know, education and and healthcare, uh, and, and I think we can we can move portfolios into some of those areas that that naturally have um, a greater focus on the social side of um, investing. Yep, and I kind of feel like a, in Australia, the with with obviously with local government regulations, and you know, we've we've sort of been in an economy that's that's looked after the the conditions of workers for probably a lot better than there a lot of countries in our region. Uh, is this something that uh, we're finding, you, you find that, you know, with, with the social side of this, that Australian companies are stronger than, say, some of the global companies? I think it's, it's certainly, a, you know, it's a bigger um, focus. You know, I think partly, you know, some of the investor groups, um, they are looking for, you know, just transitions as well. Um, it, it's... I think it's also supported by um, the government in that regard. So um, whilst I don't think our government is necessarily doing a fantastic job on climate change, you know, I think that there is a support for, um, you know, the, you know, the investors, sorry, the, the, the employees to, to really support them. And, um, you know, it, it's a fine balance. Um, but yeah, definitely it, it's a key part of the, the conversation for, you know, for any, uh, you know, any company involved in that transition type of uh, area. Yep, and and we sort of covered off on governance with some of the earlier episodes. We talked about that. Obviously, governance has been around for a long time. It's not a new part of this conversation. It's always been there with with regard to you know investment managers looking at the governance of of, of a business. Um, but from your point of view, how do we start to prioritize over when we're talking about an ESG portfolio or a green portfolio? How do we start to then try and work out how we can bring all three together or because because often they'd be prioritizing one over the other. Yeah, look. Uh- you know, I think what you're finding now is that the ESG. You know, if you look at any company, you know, if you click on their website, there's almost certainly going to be a link to their sustainability report or their governance report. Um, so it's 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 definitely not not an area that you know they're not mutually exclusive. I think that a lot of these things are you know, tied quite closely together. Um, governance, uh, you know, the focus on proxy voting, how uh, investors are voting has it has never been um, you know as great. So you know I think that that's that used to be a almost forgotten part of investing, but now it, there's a much greater focus on that. And and obviously when we're voting, you know it, it's across all all of those areas. Um, so I, I think it's naturally becoming um, ESG is becoming a um, a merged type of concept, um, um, particularly you know on the governance side and the voting. Yep. And when uh, when advisors are talking to their clients, how should they go about that conversation around um, looking at an individual client and and uh, and how they can s- sort of prioritise for that client around those E S and G topics? Yeah. Look, one one um, concept I've spoken about before is uh, the Responsible Investment Association of Australia. So, or RIA is the um, the, sh- the shortened um, term. Uh, RIA is, uh, you know, so, so they certify um, products, m- really more the, the ESG specific products. So, you know, our, our ESG ETF RARI is certified by RIA, as are our low carbon strategies. Th- these all have specific ESG um, focuses uh, and objectives. Um, and, and 
yeah, the real website actually is a useful tool for advisors in that there's there's a tool that they can they can screen for um, for products that that match their requirements. So you know, both on the negative screens and the positive side. Um, so that's probably the best um, uh, toolkit that I can suggest to advisors. Have a look at the real website and their certification tool. It can really help uh, advisors identify products that, that match the requirements of, of their clients. Fantastic, James. Thanks for coming on this episode. We look forward to catching you in the next episode where we, we get uh, into the supply and demand conversation. I look forward to that. Thanks, Razor.